I just want to give a quick thanks to the tier 5 channel members and Patreons, Bob the Dragon, Data Magnet, Cat Crab Lobster, Duck Machine, Try Again 95, and Australia the Dreamer. Thank you all very, very much. Anyways, on to the story. When Death Will This Meet, Part 10. Aranus tossed the venom aside in disgust. Not that it mattered, but she wondered whether the message had been sent as a warning or a threat. We have to get out of here, she said, not even bothering to whisper. Or hide somewhere. Yeah, definitely, agreed Stephen, looking to the cage. She had been afraid he'd get that idea. Well, it was most certainly true that she wasn't quite ready to introduce Stephen to a skeleton French just yet, for fear that he might take the wrong way. She had other, more silent concerns. For one, while the bars might afford some small measure of protection, forcing their assailants to more carefully aim their shots, it was far from perfect. As much as she had moved around in there, they had always found a way to hit her before. But that alone did not give her pause. Some protection, even just to temporarily confound the enemy, beat nothing any night of the week. No, she wasn't going back into that tiny cage for one simple reason. She couldn't bring herself to go back in there. Not after she'd spent an almighty knew how long alone inside that ossery. With no time, nor thoughts, nor company. Hoping only for death to claim her and end the torment. Just thinking about it made her shake. I don't think it'll work, she said. We have to find something else. We'll find something else after we get some cover in there, he said, stepping inside the cage to examine it. She heard a cascade of crunching noises. That had to be Twinagard. Stephen's foot had gone right to each chest, smooshing some choice organs she'd been saving. What the shit, Aridus? He heard the man yell. Is this a oh god? It's like a slaughterhouse in here. She mentally shrugged. She doubted his feet were very clean, but she would be dead long before she worked up the courage to eat more of Twine's foul-tasting, rotting entrails anyway. Don't be mad at me, she said, indignant. You're the one who wasn't looking where he was going and ruined my supper. What a bush gentleman you are. Can't even see where your meat comes from. No. Oh, God, no. His voice barely above a whisper, his hand moving to cover his mouth and nose. He rolled Twine's head to the side, examining the skull cavity. One of his eyes fell out, though she had chewed most of his face away. She'd gone to great trouble to leave him in there, so he seemed more interested in what she had to say. I think, um, I think these were intelligent people. They made you eat them? Of course not, she said. I could have starved or played their little games, got some gruel, and as my reward, got to take a little longer to starve to death. But those lunatics, killing their own slaves just to feed you. S slaves? She cocked her head to the side, confused. You mentioned something about that before. Maybe, but I don't think so. One of them was perfectly content to torture me all on his own accord. He seemed like he was rather enjoying himself, actually. The other two were his friends. I think they were in the employ of the warden. Well, that makes it even worse, Stephen said. I wonder why anyone would work for a captain if he's that kind of guy too. He paused, looking down at the remnants of the three monsters, then back to her. She grinned wide, flashing her pearly white teeth at him. She felt quite proud of her perfect smile. The corners of Stephen's mouth curled up in response. Ah, I see. The captain didn't kill these people, he said in a flat tone. Of course he didn't. Why would he do that? I did, she said. They're monsters. They took me and tortured me. They deserved no less. Right, he said, nodding his head. And you ate them. Monsum? She asked, sarcasm and humor laid on thick. I could prepare some wonderful sausage for you out of that one's intestines. That one's in it, oh, and the third one's back fat. Season them with some slime mold, and it's supper foot for a queen. He appeared to be the opposite of amused. She sighed, seeing his revulsion had been genuine. I did it because I had to, my gentleman. Not because I wanted to, she explained carefully. It's true that I don't entirely see this as cannibalism, which I know you're thinking because thought crossed my mind too. The truth is, for whatever reason, 
I just can't seem to think of them as people, no matter what they say or how intelligent they seem. I cannot place myself as them, think as they would think, or feel ill for their illness. Do you understand? Hmm, yes, I understand. What about me? he asked. It hurts me deeply that I hurt you without cause, she said, rubbing her chest. I feel for you more than I would my own kin, and while I'm sure you would be absolutely delicious to eat, you're very clearly a person, so that would be cannibalism. Still, best to be on guard around me, she finished, playfully snapping her jaws at him. He walked to her and crouched down in front of her. Without warning, he gently tapped her on the nose. Just you try it, he said with what must have been a smirk. He leaned over, scooping her into his arms. Embarrassed, she tried to help herself to her feet without him, but she was already standing with his assistance. No man from her people could have lifted her like that. Of course, no man she'd ever seen was as large as him either. What are you doing? she asked. They had nowhere to go except... First, we get you to your feet, he said. Then we walk into the cage for some... No, 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 she said, pushing away from him. I don't care how big you are. You're not going to get me in there. Not now. Not ever. He tried to urge her ever so gently into the cell. Come on, Aranus. We have to... No! She yelled into his face, her teeth narrowly missing everything from the furry patch above his left eye to the bottom of his chin. Shocked by why she'd almost done, she looked away. I'm sorry. It, it, that isn't me. I... I just can't go in there. If that means I die standing here, then please just let that happen. Not a problem. I think I understand, said Stephen. And I'm sorry for trying to make you do something you didn't want to do. What if we climbed on top of the cage instead? The bars beneath us should still offer some protection. I... Uh, I could try that, she offered hopefully. But if we start and I don't want to anymore... Then we stop and find some other way to protect ourselves, he finished for her. She nodded with a smile. Help me over there, she said. She leaned heavily on the tall man, still uneasy on her feet. You're heavy. What do you eat, lad? Just kidding. I know what you eat, he joked with a smile, wrapping one arm around her waist and pulling her other over his opposite shoulder. His hand had tickled where he held her above her hip causing her stomach to tense. He took notice. That's why you must spend a lot of time in the weight room. Have you thought about switching to cardio? She was about to ask what that was, followed by asking what the next step was in the escape, when a loud cracking and whining noise startled her. Had it come from the voice indentation in the wall? That time had just run out. It was bound to happen sooner or later. She cursed the warden for the thousandth time. The seven hells that the translators reactivate. Well, find out how before I send you to ask them, the warden's voice screamed, seemingly to neither she nor Stephen, but somebody entirely unseen. Perhaps that person was in the adjacent room with the warden from whence he spoke. Night Beast, you will slash the human until he bleeds out immediately, or I will personally administer your bath time every single day, all day, until your skin is flayed from your bones. Wide-eyed, she felt the human ship beside her. I will not hurt this gentleman again, she yelled, unsteadily splaying her claws and rising her pads to full height, almost a head taller than Stephen. And I swear upon my honor as her imperial majesty's dame commander, that I will personally call to your body and remove your head in that order with my bare feet. It was the first thing that she had said to any of the takers, but she had let that particular secret go when she had introduced herself to Stephen. So be it, said the warden. Two embrasures opened up on opposite sides of the room followed immediately by a pair of loud pops. Stephen heard the sounds and knew instantly that the dark guns were poisoned arrows which Aranus had warned him of. At hearing the sound, he gave no thought to immediately pushing his companion away from him. She must have had the same idea, because when his hand met her shoulders, her hands met his chest. They didn't so much shove each other away as explode apart. Adrenaline was a hell of a drunk. It was far too late for either of them, he knew, 
he could feel his start jabbing into his back where he landed on top of it, painfully forcing it deeper beneath the skin. He could see her sticking out of his side, just at the level of what would be a kidney on a human. Against all odds, he saw her getting to her feet, staggering towards him. He marveled at her persistence and strength of will, pulling himself to a seated position to yank the barbed dart from his back. A few milliliters of viscous blue liquid remained inside, but the rest had clearly been injected into his body. He wondered how much time he had. He wondered how much time Aranus had. She staggered to the dazed halt in front of him. Like a puppet with all her strings cut, she fell on top of him, pressing him to the deck. End of chapter. And that, my friends, concludes this video. I hope that you enjoyed. Ah, 